everybody. Welcome back to Beer and Money. My name is Ryan Burklow. On today's episode, we're not going to have Mr. Alex Collins. He is indisposed at the moment. Uh, by the way, it is the well, first day of March Madness, Thursday, March 21st. So go Wildcats. For those of you who don't know, uh, I'm a diehard U of A alum, uh, and it is their first game today. So I'm excited for that. Hence the sweatshirt. Um, today's episode, you know, we were just at a conference and at conferences, Alex and I love to chat with other advisors and make sure that we're bettering our practice, helping our clients uh, to the best of our, our ability. And at this conference, we started discussing, you know, factors that impact uh, financial success the best. And there are four factors that Alex and I talk into quite often, but I don't think we've really kind of labeled them as the four factors that impact your greatest financial success. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, for those of you who are listening to us, you might want to go check out the YouTube channel today because I'm going to be doing a lot of visuals on today's episode. Um, I'll do my best uh, on the audio side to explain what's occurring, um, but uh, definitely check out the YouTube channel because I think the visual will add uh, really the, the data to back up what we're going to say. So without further ado, let's kind of dive in here. Let me share my screen. And so... Impact number one, when we are looking at impacts of financial success, number one won't surprise you, um, and it's the amount of wealth that we have, like anything in life, of financially speaking, right? That this net worth number it is important from the standpoint of, obviously, the greater this number is, uh, the greater flexibility you will most likely have. But the big thing that I think we often overlook, or maybe other advisors may often overlook, or maybe you listening to this often overlook, is this tends to be the only factor that we focus on. And it's built around the rate of return conversation, like how big can we grow the number? And there are three other factors that are key. Matter of fact, sometimes you, we can actually, depending on these other factors, this number, this net worth number could be lower and kick off a higher cash flow or income to you in retirement. Okay, so that's number one. We can't ignore it. The amount of wealth does have a, a an impact. It's just not the greatest impact. Number two, and this is something that Alex and I speak into quite often, location of wealth. So for those of you who are watching on the YouTube channel here, you'll notice when we're looking at their wealth, it's over here in blue, the assets column. You know, this, this person has $20,000 in savings. And then really the most, the rest of their money from a from an income standpoint, sitting in a retirement account. And this is a IRA or 401k, a tax deferred account. And it's $750,000. And then the other asset that they have is their house, real estate. Now, maybe they can sell this house when they get to retirement and downgrade. That's a factor here, obviously. But if we're, we're going to focus really on the other accounts, and like many people in America, what they do is they have some amount of money sitting in savings as their quote unquote emergency fund. Um, now, we're not here to argue uh, whether or not 20 grand is enough or not enough, because uh, really that 20 grand is not going to, you know, that's not the number for retirement income. The $750,000, though, think about that. That's in a tax deferred vehicle. So every dollar that they pull out is taxable in retirement. And it's not just that money that's taxable. If they're also getting social security, you have to add those two numbers together and then that's also taxable. So it's not just the income from the accounts that we have to establish, it's income that's coming from other places like pensions and social security. So it has an effect. And we've all heard the saying of don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yet that's what many Americans are doing is they're deferring the tax and hoping that they're in a lower tax bracket in retirement. I don't know about you. I don't rely. I don't like to rely upon hope. I'd rather have control. And we really can't control what the tax brackets are going to look like when we get to retirement. And so, and please don't take this as I'm saying, don't put money in a tax deferred vehicle. What I'm offering is maybe you should look at, should we put all of our money in a tax deferred vehicle? Because as we've gone through in many occasions, there are different distribution strategies, but those strategies don't happen or don't work as well when the money hasn't already been taxed. So where else can we put money? Well, we've got investments, right? You can get, actually start a, a brokerage account and invest just like you do in your 401k, 
It's just not in a tax deferred vehicle. Or you could do a Roth 401k or Roth IRA, right? Certain forms of permanent life insurance might make sense. Now, keep in mind the life insurance is the death benefit first, but some of these policies have cash value that grow tax deferred and you could get access to that money tax free. So there, there's CDs, there's checking accounts. There's a bunch of places that you could put money. Does it make sense to have balance or at least some sort of, let's call it diversification on where you're putting your money because where you put your money matters when you go to turn on that into an income stream. And we're gonna talk more about the taxation here in a minute. So that's the location of wealth. That has a big factor, right? Real estate, maybe you're buying a bunch of real estate and maybe it's kicking off a passive income stream and that's great. The other aspect is, is maybe you wanna sell it that has a factor of, okay, can we sell it? What's going on with the market? What's going on with interest rates? What's the taxation, right? The state that you're in, federal uh, taxes as well. So there's a bunch of factors to consider, yet I don't think when many people sit down and think about, okay, where should, where should I put my money? Their knee-jerk reaction is, well, let's just put it all on my 401k. So something just to consider there. Next, we're gonna go to number three. And number three is what we call true liquidity ratio. Now, you've probably heard the term liquidity before, and liquidity is more of access to money without high taxes and fees, right? Like the savings account is extremely liquid. You can get after that money within seconds. Investment account would also be liquid, right? Because you could um, sell. Uh, and then now obviously there's the, what risk you took in that investment account, but you could get access to that money within 48 hours or so, right? If you're in retirement, sometimes the retirement accounts, or if you're 59 and a half, you can get access to that money as well. But I brought up the term risk. So this is where we put in a little twist on liquidity. And this is why we call it true liquidity. So imagine you're in retirement. You go into retirement and the very first year you retire, the market is down. Like imagine 2022, right? The S&P was down, I think like negative 16% or something like that. Down quite a bit, down double digits. That's the year you retire. Well, if all of your money's in the market, right? And while it might not be as aggressive, right? Maybe you went to a 60-40 allocation, 60% 60 of your money's in stocks, 40% in bonds maybe right? As opposed to when you're pre-retirement, you may have been a 90-10, 90% stocks and 10% bonds. So you, you, you de-risked a little bit, but money's still in the market. So there's still a risk there. So what could you do different? Well, having money on the sidelines that's not correlated with the market allows greater flexibility and frankly, could provide a little bit more wealth or what I would call uh, maybe peace of mind in retirement. And let me go over a calculator with you to kind of prove to you what I mean. So we have a calculator, it's called True Liquidity Calculator. And, you know, again, so much of this is we can't predict the year we retire or even that 20, 30 year retirement time period. We don't know what the market's going to do. This is the part that we can't control. And so what I built out here is a calculator. So we're, we're starting, uh, we're studying a 20 year period, you know, pick the year 2000 in this, ex in, in this instance, it stops in 2019. That's the 20 year period we're looking at. So imagine this person's retiring in the year 2000. They've got a $2 million balance in the market, right? They want to withdraw $80,000 a year and they're going to keep base with inflation. I use a 3% inflation number. So with those of you on, on the audio side, simplistically, this person retired with $2 million. They want to withdraw $80,000 a year with inflation at 3% uh, over this 20 year period of time. And as we go down and look at this, now I'm not counting investment fees or anything like that. Now I did throw an income tax of 28%. I don't know what taxes are gonna be. And we're looking at a marginal tax rate just to measure um, how things operate here. So as we go down and look at this, and actually let me just take out some of these numbers here because I wanna show you one side of it. So as we go down and look at these numbers, we're going to look on the left side. So this, this left side here, the variable only, started with 2 million. Here's what occurs. In the year 2000, the rate of return, for those of you who remember, was not a great year. It was negative 7%. So this person took out $80,000 from their portfolio 
And at the end of the year, it's worth 1.775. So they took out 80 grand, but it's down 225,000. Next year, right? It, the market was down again in negative 11.56%. And at the end of the year, now the portfolio balance is worth a little bit shy of 1.5 million. So in a two year period of time, this client has taken out $80,000 in year one and then $82,400 in year two. And that, that's with the inflation. And their nest egg that was at 2 million is down to 1.5. Do you think at, that they might be freaking out at all? Maybe, maybe not. Year three occurs. Now we're at negative 17%, right? You can see the, the play here. And what occurs now, we have great years. 2003, 36% was the rate of return. 2004, 17%. Right? There are great return years to help that money come back up, but the money they take they took out to live on doesn't come back up, right? So at the end of this 20-year period, their nest egg is dropped. So they started with 2 million. 20 years later, their nest egg is now worth 127 or almost $128,000. Okay? What could they have done differently? And this is what we talk about true liquidity ratio. Imagine this client gets to retirement and 1.5, so there are $2 million in the market is now 1.5 million. And let's just say they stash the other $500,000 in a different account that's not correlated with the market. This could be maybe a CD, uh, some form of that. And they're going to get a rate of return of call it three or 4%. I'll put 4% for this instance. Now keep in mind, I keep the taxes at 28%. And they're going to still withdraw $80,000. The difference is they're going to withdraw the $80,000 from the appropriate account. Meaning if the market's down, they're not taking the 80 grand from the variable account, the, the money that's in the market. They're going to take the money from the, the account that's steady Eddie. That's not in the market. And we're still going to keep in pace with inflation with the 3%. So as I hit recalculate here, so now we're going to look at the calculator on the right. And you can see here, it's the variable account plus the true liquidity account. Okay. And here, same rates of return, negative seven the first year, negative 11 the second year, negative 17 the third year. But what they did was, and I'm going to scroll over, they took out the 80 grand, but they took it from the liquidity account, the true liquidity account. So their $500,000 with the rate of return and whatnot is now dropped to 440. Okay. And their total and their portfolio 1.5 went down to 1.4, but they didn't take any money from that account. They took the 80 grand from the $500,000 true liquidity account. And now at the end of year one, their total asset value is 1.8 versus 1.775. Look at year two. Again, the same rates return, it's negative again. So they took $82,400 this year. Again, that's the inflation number. They're 80 grand with the 82.4. And they're again, they're taking it from the true liquidity account. So now their true liquidity account is now down to 375. And their um, portfolio in the market's now at 1.2. And their overall balance is 1.6 compared to 1.5. I'm going to scroll down and kind of cut to the chase here. At the end of the 20 years, if we have a variable account plus the true liquidity account, we have still $563,000, almost five sixty-four, dollars on the right side here. That's the side where we took one point five dollars left in the market and we took $500,000 and put it in that true liquidity account. That's an account that's not correlated with the market. So which one would you rather have? One twenty-seven, dollars where you're just taking money from one account, that variable account, which many people do, or... The account on the, the uh, stats on the right here, where it's 563, because we separated the money and we can pull from different accounts when it makes sense. It provides the greatest flexibility. So that's what we mean by true liquidity. And I think many people don't think about that. Many people actually think they, they hear us talk into this and they think, OK, well, what I'll do, Ryan, is I'm going to build all my wealth in different investment accounts, because I heard you with the location of your money. So I'm gonna have some money in my 401k, some money in my Roth, maybe I'll open up an investment account, maybe I'll have a CD. So they've got money everywhere. So they did great there. But what they didn't consider was growing this true liquidity account all the way through as well. And the risks that they run if they don't do that. Because what they're thinking is, well, the year I retire, the year before I retire, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sell 
$500,000 and then I'll put it in that true liquidity account and then I'll do this. And my question to them is, when do you sell? And they kind of look at me, well, the year before I retire, maybe a couple of years before I retire. And I, and I ask them, well, what if that is the time when the market is down? And then they kind of go, I don't know. I was like, can we predict that? And of course they say no. And then I said, what if the market's going crazy up? Will you have the discipline to sell? And again, they, they, that's when they kind of question this, right? And I get it. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm an investment person as well. I like return on my money, but I don't like chasing return. I'd rather build balance and control my financial future. Okay. So that's tr true liquidity. I'm going to go to the, the last calculator here and it's going to be in taxes. I've done this before and I apologize if you've seen it, um, you know, several times, but I can't explain this one enough because I think it's often misunderstood. And this is how taxes work. Okay. Imagine, you know, on the uh, balance sheet before I showed this person made $250,000 of income. So that $250,000 of all of it is taxable at ordinary income rates. Here's what we're looking at. Their marginal tax brackets, 24%. Their effective tax rate is 18%. What the difference is between marginal and effective, okay? Effective rate is you take the total amount of taxes, in this case, $46,000, you divide it by 250, and now that's the 18%. The marginal tax bracket is the highest rate of taxes that you'll pay on some of your money. So the way it works is this. The first $23,000 is taxed at 10%. And then you can see the next call it, what is that, $70,000, $71,000 is taxed at 12%. And then the next call it, $107,000 is taxed at 22%. And this person's, the last $49,000 of their income is taxed at 24%. That's how the tax brackets work. Now, it, earlier when I was talking about location of wealth and how we can mess with how do we control our tax bracket, here's certain, depending on where your money is, we can do certain things like this. So if we look at scenario two, $250,000 is what they want of cash flow, but let's just pretend 175,000 of it is actually taxable. Marginal tax bracket's 22%, but they're effective, and this is the key, their effective tax rate went down to 11%. That's a 38% difference on their taxes. They went from $46,000 in taxes to 28. That's drastic, and this can occur depending on where you put your money and the strategy that you use to distribute that money, right? We've talked about amortization. We talked about annuitization in other episodes, so make sure you check that out. In this instance, again, their gross cash flow is 250. Taxable of that is 175, so think about this. 250, subtract out $28,000, right? They're essentially bringing home $218,000 net over here is a lot less, right? Over here, it's like $204,000. The drastic difference. So understanding how taxes work plays into account the location of your money. You have to understand, think with the end in mind, where you're putting your money today, how are you gonna access it and what are the tax consequences? And then take the risk piece of it. Obviously, we want to have, we want to be in the market. We want to beat or at least keep pace with inflation. But also having money on the sideline allows the greatest flexibility because we can't control the market. And when the market's down and we want to take money out, the last place you want to touch is the money that's variable. So again, real quick review. The four factors that impact your financial success are one, the amount of wealth, two, location of wealth, three, your true liquidity, and four, taxes. And there's a fifth one, and this is probably one of the greatest one, but we spoke about it in another episode, but I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up. And this is essentially controlling your cash flow. Understanding, and people will use the word budget, but it's more of like, Spend your money on stuff you value. Don't keep up with the Joneses, right? 
that's a huge piece. And that, that's definitely probably the number one piece, because if you outspend your income, it's not going to work out great for you. Hope this episode was about valuable for you. Make sure you head over to beerandmoney.net. You can check out the podcast there, as well as we have the video uh, there as well, or the YouTube channel, either one. Look, we started this podcast to hopefully bring some knowledge uh, for you all so that you can take actionable steps in your finances so that you can live the life that you want. I hope this episode is valuable for you. Make it a great day. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not to be construed as tax, legal, or investment advice. Although the information has been gathered from sources believed to be reliable, please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon only when coordinated with individual professional advice. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or quantified financial partners, and opinions stated are their own. Guardian, its subsidiaries, agents, and employees do not provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Consult your tax, legal, or accounting professional regarding your individual situation. All investments and investment strategies contain risk and may lose value. This material is intended for general public use. By providing this content, Park Avenue Securities LLC is not undertaking to provide investment advice or a recommendation for any specific individual or situation or to otherwise act in a fiduciary capacity. Please contact a financial representative for guidance and information that is specific to your individual situation. Ryan and Alex are registered representatives and financial advisors of Park Avenue Securities, LLC. OSJ 200 Market Street, Suite 1850, Portland, Oregon 97201. Phone number 503-221-1226. Securities products and advisory services offered through Park Avenue Securities, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representatives of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. Park Avenue Securities is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Quantified Financial Partners is not an affiliate or subsidiary of Park Avenue Securities or Guardian. Ryan Burklow, CA Insurance License, number 0K24924. Alexander Collins, CA Insurance License, number 0H24806. Pinpoint number 2024, 171717. Expiration March 2026.